It is unbelievable. Tuesday, October 19th. And why is that unbelievable? Because a mere 34 years ago today, uh, those of a certain age will remember that day. I certainly do. This is the macro setup. I'm Guy Adami. I'm joined by Dan Nathan. Today's macro setup is being brought to you by our presenting sponsors, Nadex, the leading U.S. exchange for binary options, call spreads, and knockouts. And by the way, we got a real knockout coming. That would be in the form of Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX. He'll be here in a few minutes. And of course, our friends at Open Exchange, Dan, because they manage virtual meetings that matter for the top companies around the world. You can tell I'm all geeked up on the Mountain Dew. How are you? I'm doing great, but guy, are we having, do we have a thing right now? Usually you introduce me as my dear friend. So without that, I'm feeling like a little. Oh, did just, I leave that out? I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, but here's the thing. Uh, my what dear happened, friend, Dan Nathan. Sorry, there we go. What go. happened sorry, What happened 34 years ago today? What, 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 what well, was that? I, if memory serves, Dan, um, yeah. that was a market crash. And I think crash is in the appropriate terms in yeah. terms of percentage moves. I mean, today, as Karen Feynman tweeted out, there would be an eight thousand point move in the dow jones industrial average think about them apples yeah no it is crazy i mean i think it's important for investors in general to remember that when you know we're in these periods of kind of low vol kind of buy the dip you see these nice steady trends when things get disconnected and we remember this in february and march of 2020 i mean the volatility bands just explode and i think a lot of investors are not ready for that because they don't see it that frequently and i guess you know Cooler heads usually prevail. It seems a pretty brutal when you're in the middle of those things. I think you were very early in your career, Guy. You got uh, trial by fire there back there in 87, huh? <laughs> we were celebrating my 50th birthday the night before, yeah. and then whammo. It was <laughs> yeah. Listen, you know who has a pretty cool head has been Tom Lee. Yeah. And quite frankly, you know, it's hard to go against what Tom has been saying. And he came out with something. This is sort of our first point of the day. Signs pointing to more risk on. And you know what? He's been right. All these dips have been opportunities. He's been steadfast in his belief. You can speak to it, but good for Tom Lee, who's had a cool head while others seemingly are losing theirs. Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, when you think of punditry in general, you know, you and I do a lot of stuff. We speak on uh, on TV, on CNBC's Fast Money. We do the macro setup. We have our podcast. And what we're trying to do is kind of pick out the things, I guess. You, you used to say that you grew up in the school of what could go wrong, may go wrong, or something like sure, that. Sure. You know, and, and, and people like Tom, he's built a business over at Fundstrat. And he's been on macro setup uh, before are trying to figure out the things that can go right because generally in markets things do go right right and so every once in a while you have those kind of reversion sort of setups and that's why it's been in this rate environment we're going to talk a bit more about that it has made sense to buy stocks on the dip when fear gets higher he thinks about things in very quantitative terms but he also adds a little qualitative inputs here and there that can kind of give you the confidence i love the fact guy that he used the term wobble the market had a little wobble off of those recent highs and you know what down 5.2 percent the s p 500 from the highs it felt like just that a wobble it was not a correction it didn't invoke a whole heck of a lot of fear well i mentioned people of a certain age those same people of the same certain age will remember that weebles wobbles but in fact they won't <laughs> fall down neither will this first chart dan which is s p 500 I mean, here we are, you know, again, lower left, upper right. Yes, we had that stumble. Yes, I thought we'd trade down to 4150 in the, in the S&P 500, which coincides with the support line that you drew in the 200-day moving average. Uh, doesn't look like it's going to happen anytime soon. As a matter of fact, I think a lot of people would look at this chart and say, we're off to the races, and it's just a matter of time before we break through those, pr those prior all-time highs. Yeah, I would say from a technical standpoint right now, keep an eye on that 50-day moving average. It's gone sideways now for like the last month or so, and that was a key breakdown level back in September. We just broke out above it on Friday here. I mean, listen, no doubt about it, guy, there is technical resistance at that prior high. And when you think about where we've just come from in a short period of time over the last week, it would take a meaningful breakout of Apple, Amazon getting back on its horse. It has that, had a good bounce. Uh, Microsoft just made new all-time highs, Facebook and Google, because that's the only way you drag up an index, an index like this to new all-time highs in a runaway breakout. The good news is there are catalysts, there are earnings, and people um, have like lowered expectations, at least from a sentiment standpoint, into that. But from a technical perspective, keep an eye on that 50-day. If it breaks, I suspect we see the lows from early October 
quarter. And it could be a fundamental piece of news as it relates to earnings, margins, input costs, all of the above, buddy. Yeah, and the 50-day coming in around 44, 40 or thereabouts. The NDX, obviously, is something we need to take a look at. Hauntingly similar, um, I would say, in terms of what the chart looks like in comparison to the previous chart. But again, you know, the 200-day moving average comes in at that support line. You know, past resistance becomes support. You drew it, Dan, somewhere around 14,100-ish in the NDX. But again, if Facebook, which has seemingly now gotten off the mat, Apple, seemingly have gotten off the mat amazon microsoft you mentioned google you know if those horsemen can continue their climb higher off of albeit a bit of a sell-off i mean there's no reason to suggest that this is not going to ratchet through that horizontal line on the upside that you drew yeah well again we bring up those five names because they make up 45 percent of the nasdaq 100 an index of 100 stocks they make up nearly 25 percent of the s p 500 that is an index of 500 stocks you know the drill here i just say this going back to kind of q2 earnings in july you know amazon had a massive gap lower and it kept on going the fact that it's rallied back pretty substantially from its recent lows that makes that set up that much harder, especially when you consider a lot of the bottlenecks that we're seeing in supply chains and higher input costs and the like. And we already saw horrible guidance from FedEx, and we know that logistics is a big part of what Amazon does. So just keep an eye on that. Microsoft, Facebook, you know, less uh, immune, you know, or less exposed. The same with Google as to some of those sorts of trends. But Apple guy, I know that you got all excited about their MacBook Pro event that they had yesterday. That stock is sneakily almost back. Back to its all-time highs yeah you know it's we mentioned it on fast money that obviously that headline came out about ratcheting down uh the amount of deliveries they're going to make based on supply chain concerns that happened in the after hours and the stock did sell off i think it traded down you know better than i do but around 137 and a half 138 ish and the next day the stock closed just marginally lower and i said it on the show that night that i was actually very impressed with how apple traded that day and now here we are probably north of 146 you know, say what you want about Apple. We have seen many peak to trough declines over the last four years. Maybe we just saw another one and maybe we are headed higher. It is shocking to me, though, uh, how geeked up people get about these Apple days. People live tweeting the headlines. If you're doing that, you're living life entirely the wrong way. And yes, I'm talking to a number of you out there. Dan, Nathan, back to you. Please. Yeah, I would just say this about the Apple. I mean, the bad news is kind of out unless their guidance is horrendous and the results are horrendous. Um, so the news is out. The price action is good. Um, that just means that expectations, you know what I mean, are somewhere out of whack with fundamentals and investors are willing to kind of wait and get some of whatever they had to push out in the next quarter, the quarter after that. Here's the Russell 2000 guy. And you and I have spent some time talking about this, obviously, because the interest rate sensitivity the cyclicality, the lot of uh, small cap financials um, in there. And, you know, it's been kind of tightening this range here. It looks like it's ready to kind of make a move one way or the other. Um, you know, we see that huge ramp from the vaccine news and the election news um, last November here. And we just see that we uh, have a 50 day and a 200 day converging. It's going to break one way or the other here. Um, what is your inclination and does it drag large caps with it? It's interesting. You know, my inclination is we break to the downside and not because I'm always bearish. That's not the reason why. The reason why I think that, again, these are the most economically sensitive names. We're going to talk about yields in a second. Yields are going higher, but yields are not going higher, in my opinion, because the economy is getting better. Yields are going higher because prices are going up. And I think, quite frankly, the economy might be ratcheting down. So it stands to reason that these names, which are sensitive to the economy, we're going to start to falter here. Now, quite frankly, you drew this chart over the last two, two and a half years for good reason. You wanted to show that ramp up and then you wanted to show the subsequent sideways action that we've been in. Um, again, peaking in March when yields topped out and then going sideways ever since as this is trying to figure out what do we want? Do we want higher yields? Do we want yields to stabilize? Or in fact, do we want lower yields? Again, I think if the 10 year traded through that 177 level this time, uh, I don't think the RTY would uh, act in kind like it did back in March. And here is the 10 year, which you've drawn. You see that level of resistance on the upside. It's going to come in probably right around 168, 169 or thereabouts. Obviously, not to the level we saw in March as that trend line sort of goes from the upper left to the lower right 
pretty flat, but you know what I'm trying to say here, Dan. Yeah, no doubt about it. We're going to talk to Chris Vecchi about expectations for rate hikes and taper and the like. It just seems like the market or investors are getting getting in front of that a little bit. I mean, listen, I, guy, I, I see, I'm hard pressed to see a retest and just a breakout without some sort of back and fill, maybe towards that 1.5. We did last week. I just want to see a bit more tension building here. And to your point, I mean, if rates are going up for the wrong reasons, I think in March, rates were going up because people People were expecting the pandemic to be behind mm -hmm. us, by, right? And, and really growth inflecting. And when you look at the GDP data out of China and you look at some of the, the, the slowdown that they're seeing across goods and services below 5% GDP, I'm hard pressed, man, to see that we're going to see a meaningful pickup um, in the early part of 2022. But who knows? I guess it really comes down to how long is transitory? How long will we have some of these pricing pressures upon us? Because that's the thing that will be determinant, in my opinion, of equity valuations, where the market should be trading. And we did have, I mean, listen, make no mistake, that sell off over the last few weeks from the September 2nd highs was concern about growth, concern about higher prices, and concern concern about what central banks are going to need to do to combat that in the face of slowing growth. As we take a look at our next chart, you mentioned how long. One of the great baselines in rock history was from the song How Long by a group named Ace. Uh, you'd think it's a song about a guy's girlfriend wandering. In fact, it's a song about a band member playing with another band. But I completely digress, Dan, because I know you don't really care. <laughs> no. uh, but how long has this been going on? Well, in terms of the 10-year yields, it's been going on for quite some time, 30 years, as it turns out. Yeah, about as long as that downturn. story, guy. Yeah. It, it, that's really what happened. <laughs> oh, man. You know what? You Please know, your continue. Little, Please your continue. Little, your little story reminds me of that song, Angie. But, uh, you know, that. But I digress now as we go into deep cuts as it relates to music. I mean, listen, upper left, bottom right. You know, you tell me, guy, if interest rates get to 2% in the 10-year, what happens? Every single one of those peaks that we saw in rates over this period, at least over the last 20 years, have corresponded with a market top. The last one in 2018, you saw what happened there when we got to about 3.2% in the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield. How much did the S&P 500 go down in about three months, guy? It went down, Dan, as you know, as I like to say, 19.9% in a straight line. Yeah. All right. See the let's, way I leaned in we, there? Yes, see the way I, did. I leaned in there? It, yeah. It's a bit creepy. Stay back, buddy. Um, let's well, go back to the early 80s or late 80s, I guess, please. when you started in the please. business. And you were trading a lot of commodities back then. And this headline, I think, from Bloomberg is really interesting, talking about the copper spread wines. I saw Joe Wiedenthal kind of tweet this chart out um, a little bit here. And going back 25 years, guy, that's not even what you were like. a You were like a veteran in the business 25 years ago. When you see... This sort of disconnect in a commodity like this, in this sort of environment that we are in between spot and futures, what does that say to you? Well, I mean, it's funny. Depending on what side of the tracks you're on in terms of bullish or bearish, a lot of people would say this steep curve just, it speaks to um, maybe the fact that it's just a front month loaded thing. In other words, supply, demand is here, but it's not going to be. I look at this and say we have a serious supply problem and it's just not there to meet the demand that we're seeing. You don't see things like this ever, quite frankly. And now we're seeing it not only in copper, but we're seeing it in aluminum, we're seeing it in zinc and in tin. And quite frankly, to a certain extent, we're seeing it in crude oil as well. And with all those indices that sort of mirror the commodities, the, the CRB, the Goldman Sachs Commodities Index are telling you the same story. Here's a crude chart. Um, and I do think we're breaking out. It's going to be interesting to see what Chris Vecchio thinks. But you know, we've talked about this for a while. We did everything we needed to do in terms of that back and fill. We traded down to we traded up to that 13 year downtrend. We failed. Well, we're right through it now. Dan, I know you have a different view, but I have to, I, I think we could see triple digit crude oil by the end of this year. And by the end of this year, that's coming up in a hurry as we are here mid October. Yeah, you know, listen, I, I suspect that we see a pullback back to that breakout level. It's probably somewhere around 76, 77 or something like that. And then you tell me what the fundamentals look like. I just say what I'm thinking about crude in general, when you have this sort of move um, that we've had off of like 62, 63 from the lows um, in August to where we are right now, it can't go really unabated. I mean, it has to kind of have a back and fill sort of situation. And the other point I'll just make is that we were having this conversation, Guy, in early July, or a lot of people were about triple 
triple digit crude per barrel and we got a 20% sell off. It seems like everybody got on one side of the boat here. And again, you know, every day that transitory gets stretched out a little bit, we are actually that much closer to prices coming in at some point. So to me, you know, maybe I had it wrong. I was calling it the transitory tantrum over the summer. Um, markets weren't really having a tantrum. Pundits were, they appear to be right. The Fed appears to be wrong. Prices are staying higher longer than people thought. At some point, that has to reflect itself in equity valuations, in my opinion. Of course, you mentioned the boat. So Hughes Corporation saying rock the boat. You know what's rocking the boat right now? That would be the dollar index. As we get close to this 95 level, I've said a number of times, Tim Seymour says it as well, a, a rising dollar is a bit of a wrecking ball for, for basically for indices and for stocks and for multinationals. And here we are at levels we haven't seen in quite some time. I know Chris Vecchio has some thoughts, but the dollar seems to be on its horse. It's stalled, it appears, at this 94 and a half level. Um, but it looks like it wants to continue to go higher. What are your thoughts here in the DXY? Yeah, it just brings me back to kind of U.S. corporate earnings, specifically multinationals. When we talk about pricing pressures and we talk about higher input costs, when they're getting sales from outside the U.S., right, we want to see, you know, a strong dollar, like you say, is hard, right? It kind of lessens the purchasing power of foreigners here. And a lot of our multinationals, especially as we came out of the pandemic, or at least our economy, sooner than a lot of other developed nations and the emerging world, um, we're going to be relying on some growth overseas and a strong dollar really crimps that and will start to hurt margins here. So again, we drew that line. It seems to be some support. It looks down there near 90-ish. It didn't break here. I just say this, if we have a rising dollar, if we have rising rates, watch out for crude. And I know there's a lot of people a lot smarter than me who've explained why it's different this time about crude when we have a rising dollar and rising rates. But all I know, as long as I've been in the business, the kind of inverse correlation that they have. And that's why we talk about all of this guy, Dami, on the macro setup. Headline three is your ability to make fun of me. That comes in the form <laughs> of, of course, gold. Love the Ben Carlson. Does some tremendous work. Um, Americans choosing gold as the best long-term investment. I don't know what Americans they speak of over there. But clearly somebody's doing something. Well, the price on. action doesn't suggest that. Though. That was back in 2011. And that is the beauty of this tweet. OK, so back then he's saying Americans said gold was the best long term investment. That was a Gallup poll. What was going on 10 years ago? People were outraged over QE and they were outraged over zero interest rate policy and they wanted things to fail. And what were they worried about? Runaway inflation guy 10 years ago. Well, it took them 10 years in a pandemic to get it. And gold has absolutely gone nowhere and equities yes. that get bought on every dip. And that is the theme of today's macro setup. Hopefully you can come up with a good title for it. But there's your gold chart, guy. It had this moment and you called it off of the lows in 2020 and you thought we'd have that rally to new all time highs and we got it. But look at that well-defined downtrend it's been in and we're going to talk about another risk asset. And I'm going to call it a risk asset that seems to be the beneficiary of it. So what do you think a Gallup poll pulling those same Americans would say right now what they're optimistic about gold, I, equities, bonds, housing, or Bitcoin. I would say the cryptocurrencies clearly that's on the top of mind. And it's interesting in 10 years, a lot has changed, but in some ways nothing has changed. And here we are with, with this longer term chart. And you see, look, I, we saw that big sell off. We saw the big rally, but here we are gold today, exactly where we were 10 years ago. It's fascinating, which is why we brought up headline number three it's really interesting look i will be steadfast and say gold will have its day but clearly now as crypto is north of a two trillion dollar asset class that has stolen some of the thunder away from my beloved gold and here is dan your bitcoin now interesting we're at these levels are we going to see this bit of a um as you know what i like so what do I like to call a chart like this, Dan? Please. You like to call it a double top, guy. Yes, I, I mean, do. I mean, this is just, this is what you would say is, is setting up to be a textbook double top. And I mean, here's the hard thing about Bitcoin. Take the axes off of this, right? Where that low about a month and a half ago was 29,000. And here we are at 62.5. And you'd say to yourself, oh, well, maybe that's a bit of constructive. It had that kind of sharp sell off months ago. It, it had a rally. It consolidated a sharp move higher. Maybe it's getting ready to, to break out. 
You tell me, man. I, I can't get my arms around 50% sell-offs and then 100% rallies. This is uh, one that I think the hodlers or the laser eyes, you probably once had a picture on your Twitter avatar with some laser eyes, didn't you, guy? I mean, they say that the volatility is a feature, not a bug of crypto here, and they just want to buy every dip. But here's the thing. I, I, I strongly believe, relative to your gold, that every incremental dollar from somebody who would be inclined to hedge against inflation Inflation, right, um, is doing so in crypto. And there you go. There, there you have it. A lot of people have $100,000 year end price targets. I don't know how useful that is, but there you go. Well, we mentioned at the top of the show that we're going to bring in um, a knockout himself. That would be Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX. You've heard us wax poetic, CV. How are you? Talk to us about all the things you've heard. And then the first thing you want to talk about is also the Bitcoin. Hi, guys. Good to see you again. Yes, Chris. Bitcoin. Today is the BITO ETF launch, and it looks like we have a number of these ETFs coming down the pipeline. I know some people have said that this is going to be a, a big boon for the crypto market. We're going to see a lot of people come into the arena that haven't been here before. But the fact of the matter is the way that these ETFs are structured doesn't make a lot of sense to get exposure to Bitcoin via these ETFs. You know, we look at these future uh, uh, markets. We look at how these ETFs with futures in them are constructed. They end up having to sell the front month contract as we get closer to expiry. And that creates in these contango situations in which Bitcoin is in right now, a negative roll yield. So if you look at GLD, you look at USO, you look at any of these commodity futures ETFs, they actually tend to underperform the spot market. So I think it holds that if you want exposure to crypto, you still want to buy the direct crypto itself, if that's Bitcoin, if that's Ethereum, uh, at the end of the day, this could be just another waypoint uh, along the journey for more mainstream adoption and regulation is certainly welcome that it cements its place in the financial industry. But I do think that this is not necessarily a situation where it's going to be the propelling factor up to that $100,000 or $160,000 price target that's been floated. Uh, moreover, I think this is potentially an institutional top. We've had this before. We had this in the 2017 CME futures launch. We had this with the coin based direct listing earlier this year. We have this with El Salvador. These big events, they tend to mark near-term tops for Bitcoin. So while I'm still constructive here on the technicals, this is potentially a, a warning point, a place for people to take stock and potentially take some profit. I agree with you. And before we talk about this gold chart, I want to mention, I think the best thing that ever happened to gold was the gold ETF. And I think the worst thing that ever happened to gold was the gold ETF. And we'll see if it plays out now in Bitcoin. Do you point about potential short-term top. I agree with you. And the chart suggests that as Dan, as I just talked about, but you would hope that gold would at some point be the beneficiary of all the nonsense that's going on around the world. But quite frankly, it's not. You brought us this chart. What are your thoughts here as we talk about the GLD? You know, right now, actually, gold is looking a little bit more constructive from my point of view. And in part, it's because of how far Fed rate hike odds have run recently. Uh, if we take a look at, obviously, we're going to get there to the next chart. And before we get there, we'll stay with gold. But six Fed hikes are basically priced in through the end of 2023. That's a lot. We've actually seen rate hikes priced in across the board for a number of major central banks, including the Bank of England, which two weeks ago, their first rate hike was scheduled to come in perhaps February 2022. Over the past few days, that's now been pulled forward to next month before they even end their QE program. That seems a little rich. So the fact of the matter is that if we see a little bit of an unwind in some of these rate hike odds, across the major central banks, that tends to be good for gold prices. And the dollar itself is looking a little weak, even though Fed rate odds have gone up. And so gold may see another test up towards that 1800 level right now. The technicals aren't great, but I do see the inkling of a potential inverse head and shoulders pattern forming here against that low that we had in August. We have our left shoulder in late June and our right shoulder here at the start of October. I'm, it's too early to suggest that this is going to be another push to all-time highs, but another move up towards 1800, perhaps higher to the descending trend line from the August 2020, uh, or rather, yeah, in the uh, the June 2021 highs here in that 1835, 1840 neighborhood where we previously peaked in price action over the summer. That's not out of the question right now. Let's talk about those Fed rate high odds. And you mentioned central banks. I think what these central banks are basically telling you is, you know what? Inflation is here and we actually have to do something about it now as opposed to later. And to a certain extent, I think that's what this chart is indicating as well, Chris. Sure. You know, we have a few things on here. Our white line of those Fed rate hike odds is implied by the euro dollar future spread between the October 21, December 23 contracts. 
130 basis points priced in, so that's five full hikes plus another about 20% of a sixth one. We see that the 2S 10S spread, the blue line, showing that a uh, similar behavior to the taper tantrum we had back in 2014. But recently, the dollar index, our orange line here, that's come down quite a bit. And that's been unusual over the past few months. So the way I see this playing out is if we do see high odds come back down, that's tended to be dollar negative. And in that environment, that could be good for stocks, could also be good for gold. And so right now, I'm a little ambivalent about the US dollar, even though it's been one of our favorite trades over the past several weeks. Yeah, I would just say this, you know, when you think about those rate hike odds over, um, you know, 2023 in that period, it kind of reminds me a little bit of that 2014, 2015 period, Chris, where we started to see the Fed come off of zero interest rates. They obviously were tapering um, prior to that. That that schedule all makes um, a lot of sense. But really, the concern here is that if we get back into this, you know, stagflation argument that seemed to really dominate a lot over the end of August into September. And that seemed to be a worry, at least for equity participants. And then rates were kind of getting ahead of that whole thing. So how does a stagflationary environment, as we're kind of figuring out the supply chain bottlenecks, how does that inform the Federal Reserve's view on taper and rate hikes? Stagflation is the least favorite scenario for the Federal Reserve yeah. right now, uh, in part because if you raise rates, then you choke off growth, you potentially push unemployment higher. If you keep rates low, you let inflation run further ahead, and that eats into real returns. If we are facing down a stagflationary environment, it's not good for the dollar. It's also not good for stocks. Goldman actually put out a research report showing what stagflation does for the quarterly returns, and it's about a negative 2.5% return for stocks in real terms if we see a stagflation situation take root. It's hard for people to fully grasp that though right now, because what we're seeing is not just supply chain concerns, but demand from the US consumer has been absolutely through the roof. And if we were to take a look at the way earnings have been shaping up, if you take a Z score of the quarterly earnings over the past say 21 years, going back to 2000, we're currently at three standard deviations higher. Earnings are incredibly strong right now. And so stocks still have that tailwind to them. Ultimately, whether or not we see a new fiscal stimulus package at the start of 2022, that could be the deciding factor. And I know that we have Manchin and Cinema and these House Democrats and Joe Biden all meeting, trying to hash out these plans. But if we can avoid a fiscal cliff, that may avoid the stagflation situation altogether. We'll see. I mean, as you mentioned, that's a scenario that the Fed can't combat, in my opinion. We'll see. But the euro is something, obviously, that's been really interesting. Big Euro got whacked, obviously, but here we are. Again, maybe getting off the mat, I'm not sure. Or maybe we're just getting up to this downtrend line and going to fail once again. That's exactly what I'm thinking, Guy. I do think that because of what we're seeing with the dollar, with how far these rate hike odds have run, if they do come off even just a little bit, that gives the Euro a little bit more strength behind it, but not too much. Uh, ultimately, we are testing that former August low that came in play right around that 116.50 figure. If we're able to break through there, somewhere we actually found resistance earlier this morning, it pushes up us up towards that 117 figure and that descending trend line from the uh, June and September swing high. So uh, the way I see this, could more Euro strength re uh, resolve itself in the very near term? Yes, absolutely. But I don't think about much more Surely because the ECB is just so darn dovish itself. They're already talking about a new QE program after the PEPP ends. And historically speaking, the inflation differentials between the EU and the US would be favoring a weaker euro dollar heading into 2022. The, the issues they have there are much different than the ones we're facing here, but not to say that we can at some point as well. They might just be six months ahead of us. That's for another time. Dollar yen, obviously, extraordinarily interesting here. Um, this seems to be breaking out to the upside. By the way, you sort of spoke to this a few weeks ago, I think, when dollar yen was side of either side of 110-ish. Yeah, so dollar yen is the most interest rate sensitive US dollar pair, in part because the Bank of Japan is doing nothing. They have been stuck in this deflationary spiral for some time. In fact, their upcoming CPI report later this week is expected to show negative rates of inflation, deflation. And so if I'm looking at the yen right now, I actually think this is an interesting proxy what's going on in energy markets. Japan still imports over 90% of their energy ever since their uh, nuclear reactors were shut down after Fukushima. And even though they've brought some of those power sources back online, they are still a highly sensitive economy to higher energy input. So right now, if you think that energy could be going up, this speaks to a weak yen environment. It may not be vis-a-vis -vis the dollar, it could be against some of those commodity currencies, an Aussie yen and CAD yen and NAC yen. 
Uh, but right now, the way that we're seeing with the dollar yen play out, we have reached a near-term inflection point. If we take that Fibonacci extension from the low that we had in January 21, we extend it to the high that we had over the summer and back down to that early August low. We're at the 618 extension right now up in that 114.33 neighborhood. This would be a natural breathing point for dollar yen. Ultimately, the uptrend remains well intact. And so very much like what we're talking about with Tom Lee's perspective on equities here, if we do see a pullback in dollar yen, it is a buy the dip opportunity. It takes a great deal of confidence to say Fukushima on an event like this. And I appreciate the confidence that you exhibit every week on the macro setup. Thank you so much, Chris Vecchio. Dan, some parting wisdom here, please. Yeah, that was some great stuff. And I think Chris's points about stagflation and some of the stuff that's going on in Washington that might affect it. Um, I think that equity valuation should be seriously concerned with that prospect here. It is the opposite guy Adami of what you would say is a Goldilocks scenario. Let's see how equities they seem to be really ready to test those prior highs, which I did not think would happen so quickly. But God, you think that we just get the, the memo already, guy. You get a 5% dip, you buy it. You know, I mean, it's that simple. New highs, pe right? So to people as well, listen to Tom Lee. He's been right. I don't get memos anymore. That's very 1980s. We mentioned we came in with 87. We'll leave with 87. By the way, I do want to thank Chris Vecchio, who was probably born in 1987. The great Chris Vecchio, senior strategist at Daily FX. And today's macro setup, Dan, was brought. Get ready, please, Dan. Was brought to you by our presenting sponsors, Open Exchange. They manage virtual meetings that matter for the top companies around the world. And of course, Nadex, Dan, the leading U.S. exchange, please get ready, for binary options, call spreads, and knockouts. We will see you next week. I believe it'll be the 26th of October as we head in to Novi. That's letter X for you commodity traders out there. <laughs> see you next week. See you next week.